of talking to me um, and of of just being so open to to discuss her work and her activism. So it was that organic activism and, and her ethics of care that really, you know, made such an impression on me. And she was really a, a remarkable person. Um, and and over the years, our paths crossed on and off, and and the loss I think will be deeply felt, um, and and so more so also then by rural women, um, who who were the women that she really cared for very deeply. So so thank you for your participation, and I will just um, uh, the the order. Um, I'm I'm going to introduce all the speakers, and I don't have to uh, you know stop the proceedings. Uh, first, we will hear from Professor Sandiso Manesi Weeks. She is associate professor in public policy of excluded populations at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, and adjunct associate professor in public law at the, uh, the University of Cape Town. She pre previously served as a senior researcher in the Center for Law and Society at UCT, where she worked in the Rural Women's Action Research Program, now the Land and Accountability Research Center, combining research advocacy and policy work on women, property, governance, dispute management, and participation under Kasmi law and, uh, in, and the South African Constitution. She received a default from the University of Oxford Center for Social Legal Studies as a Rhodes Scholar, and previously clerked for Deputy Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, uh, Justice Dick Hang Motsuneki. Uh, following her will be Professor Nomoniso Garza. She's a researcher, writer, and political analyst on land, gender politics, development, and cultural issues. She's a research fellow at the Center for Law and Society and adjunct professor at the School of Public Law at the, uh, the University of Cape Town. Her unique contribution is her ability to straddle the academic policy, community activism, and public worlds in ways that enriches the discourse and builds common understanding. Um, in the early 1990s, she was part of the ANC's Commission for Women's Emancipation, uh, which led gender equality processes and policies during the ne negotiations and uh, imposed for post-Africa. And then it will be Shirin Matala, is acting director um, uh, impact and research development in the inclusive econ economic development program, working with the research theme of economic creation and inclusive development at the HSRC. She holds an MA in development studies at the University of KwaZulu Natal, and her research areas of and focus of work has been on early childhood development, social protection unemployment programs, impact evaluation of state funded poverty alleviation programs and active labor market programs. So thank you to all of you and um, over to you, Sandiso. Sandiso, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, of course I would be muted. <laughs> uh, my apologies. So um, I was just saying thank you, Amanda, for uh, this opportunity to honor Mum Suzani's legacy. Um, it's an honor to be with you all. And um, I myself was also really powerfully impacted by Mum Suzani and her work and just her character. And so I wanted to share um, through a series of images um, that I will sort of talk you through how I came to know Mum Suzani and, and the work that we did together, which is work that is continuing. And um, the message that I really want to share at the end of the day is that I think um, her legacy is so powerful and um, it's really important that we, we uh, continue the work that she um, helped begin. So um, I met Mum Cezani through my work at the Law, Race and Gender Research Unit at the time. Um, and it was work, sort of action research work in the Rural Women's Action Research um, uh, Project. Um, and all Mum Cezani uh, was just a force for life, uh, as uh, Amanda just described, that um, you know, she just was full of life, so warm and so energetic, and um, and she just drew you in. And I remember that uh, actually when I I first met her, to be honest, I, I'd read some of her writings, and 
like I, I don't know why, but I I I thought initially that uh, I'd be meeting a, a a gentleman, and so when then I uh, I met uh, this you know uh, elderly lady who was just so spry and so full of life. It was just very different from the image that I'd had in my mind of of who I would be meeting. Um, but uh, it was such a joy and has continued to be a joy throughout the time that I've known her. Um, the work that we did was on the traditional court spill and um, the most intense uh, period that we sort of worked together was um, in the period when the traditional courts bill um, had been introduced um, again. So it had been introduced initially in 2008 um, and then had been uh, uh, introduced through uh, the National Council of Provinces after having realized that they couldn't sort of, the, the parliament said that they couldn't do the consultation process adequately through the um, uh, National Assembly process. And so they took it to the National Council of Provinces, but it was the same bill that had been essentially rejected by um, all of the activists that spoke out. And so we were holding a national workshop to sort of gear up people to mobilize against the traditional courts bill um, in 2012. And so um, the national workshop, which uh, you just saw images of, um, was where we were working with activists um, in community-based organizations throughout the country, and Mam Sizani was one of those, um, in order to prepare people. In a sense, it was sort of a, a teach the teacher training. But the way that we did our community-based um, uh, organizing and um, community consultations was that, you know, we didn't go in and tell people, um, you know, this is what's wrong with the bill. We, we came in and asked people what their impressions were. Um, and, and it was their voices that informed the kind of activism and strategies and articulations of um, what the problems were with the legislation. And so, um, you know, essentially, you know, we it was a two day program where we did the background of the traditional courts bill. So what I've just shared about the 2008 introduction of the bill, the reintroduction in 2012. And um, as maybe Usisman Bonisa will mention, um, there has been another version that has been introduced um, in 2017, which is basically at the cusp of being um, uh, finalized and uh, brought into law by the um, National Assembly um, after recess. Um, but then there was the background of the South African Law Commission process where there had been a much more rigorous and much more inclusive process of consultation with communities and especially with women's groups to hear women's voices rather than just hearing traditional leaders, um, you know, speak about what it is that they wanted to see in this legislation on dispute resolution. Um, and we talk about the links with the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003 um, and the structures that it maintained, basically the old apartheid structures in terms of the traditional authorities and traditional leaders of, of old, and then also the, the boundaries, especially those um, boundaries of what constitute traditional communities or what used to be called tribes um, in South Africa. And now that legislation has been replaced by the Traditional and Khoisan Le Leadership Act um, of 2019, which is um, just as bad as that legislation in preserving the apartheid infrastructure um, uh, and structures, but also even worse because it takes away the opportunities that there were for communities to be involved in um, lawmaking about traditional issues um, and getting to participate and have their voices heard. And now, um, you know, traditional issues can be resolved and, and legislated in the dark, as it were, through just delegation practices without cons extensive consultation um, with communities, as was done through the legislation process. And so um, the need for consultation and preparation for its return was what brought us together at that national um, workshop that uh, we gathered at where Mam Sizani is in the red circle there in those images. And if you want to learn more about that history, you can look at the YouTube video that's online there. Um, and so following that, what we would do is we would go um, to each of the provinces, right, to prepare people. And so Mam Sizani was very quick off the mark because uh, she was a fast acting lady and she, um, you know, organized uh, a, a session through RWM in KZN, deep rural KZN in February um, in 2012. And I went to go and join her. And so we were leading these workshops. And this is just an image of the the um, 
the uh, agenda that was put together for that two day workshop and Umam Sezani, um, you know, was leading some of those sessions. And uh, what I love about these images, and I'm just going to walk you through these images, um, is the, the fact that, um, you know, it was very grassroots, you know, there we were in a hall um, and uh, the community um, partners from uh, surrounding villages and, and um, uh, townships had gathered to to come and learn about these really important issues that affect their lives and to tell their stories, right? Because this is the thing that's really important is, you know, we wanted people's voices to be heard by parliament, to be heard by government, for government to respond to the realities of what people's lives are, not the notions and um, your imaginings or projections that they were hearing from people who are in power, such as traditional leaders, especially those who are part of the traditional leader lobby uh, through the, um, uh, you know, Contra Lesa. And so um, there, Mam Sezani is, um, you know, sharing with people, you know, what we're going to be doing through the, these days. And you you see how people are really engaged. You know, people um, like to uh, behave as though or, or speak as though people in rural areas are disengaged or, or don't really care about these issues. But actually, people really care. And, you know, Mam Sezani, part of what people needed was um, the supports that would help them to, um, you know, articulate their, their concerns and to be able to convey them effectively. And so, you know, here you see people doing group work where they're discussing in sort of smaller groups, you know, what their um, concerns are and articulating them and writing them and then sharing them uh, in report backs to the group. Um, and, you know, I loved also, I remember being there and just feeling like, wow, it's amazing how they, they also engage men in the work that they do, because you think rural women's movement and you think that it's predominantly a woman, um, and it is, uh, women-led and, and predominantly a women's um, organization, but the, the importance of engaging men was never lost on them. And so here are images of, um, you know, the drafts of the submissions that people put together telling their stories and, you know, writing to the National Council of Provinces to hear Nasis Kalose to Naimi Bonuye to get TCB traditional court spell. So here are our concerns and here are our views. And um, I just love these images because, you know, you see in people's own handwriting um, their concerns articulated to the, the parliamentarians. Unfortunately, the parliamentarians have not taken their views on board um, very effectively. And so, um, as I will uh, discuss as we come to the end here, um, the fact that people actually, uh, the cries that people voiced are still um, cries that are uh, legitimate and important to be incorporated right now as the traditional courts bill um, uh, is, is currently about to be passed by the uh, National Assembly and actually remains a piece of legislation that, uh, in my argument and in the argument of Mam Sizani and the rest of the Alliance for Rural Democracy, is actually unconstitutional. And so here, what I love about this image is, is the fact that, um, you know, at the end of the report back, you know, there was real tangible action steps that people were committing to. And so here you see, you know, what is this community going to do? Who is the point person to, to um, you know, follow up on that. Um, and this last image, uh, you know, here it says, Tumela and basically, you know, they've got us, they're going to send, and these are the, the initiatives that each of the communities themselves came up with and said, this is what we are going to do in order to move this forward. And so here the, the, the community Asimangwen is saying, uh, we're going to send a date to Mam Sizani uh, tomorrow um, so that we can um, have her come and have, you know, a, a gathering where we're going to be able to um, speak to the people who are like very much at the grassroots in our locale. Um, and the key themes that emerge from all of what I've shared is um, because, of course, you wouldn't have had the chance to read the, the submissions that people articulated um, that I shared in these images, is the lack of choice, right? The fact that um, not having an opt-out clause, not being able to opt out of the traditional courts in their locales that are subject to the um, boundaries of apartheid uh, is, an, is a suppression of their citizenship rights and it is um, a denial of their rights to um, 
choose culture because actually in terms of the constitution and the bill of rights the right to culture is a right that you choose you get to the right to choose culture as an individual and as a group um, but even as a group you get to choose it as part uh, as individuals coming together as a group and and the fact that people don't get to choose whether to take their cases under customary law is a violation. Um, and then one of the other themes that emerges strongly is the lack of voice, the fact that people felt that consultations were always inadequate and even when they happened, they were ineffective. And I can say that, you know, here as we stand with the traditional courts bill um, waiting to be um, passed, uh, you know, even though there was a more rigorous consultation process with a, um, a, a, a smaller group that involved some um, you know, uh, Alliance for Rural Democracy representatives participating in that uh, group that that was um, trying to develop a new traditional courts bill. The traditional courts bill that has finally come out through the sausage machine that is the parliamentary process is one that looks very much like the one in 2008 in these key aspects that relate to especially choice. Um, and then the need and commitment to take action, to speak out and to resist, people being really clear about that. Um, and I, I um, really appreciate that, that that's what, you know, the rural women's movement symbolizes and that's what Mum Sizani's work um, has symbolized and will continue to symbolize. And so um, what did that action look like following on um, from, you know, the consultations and the community meetings that we had in community. Well, we took them to Parliament and Mum Sezani was there, you know, sort of front and centre. And so here you have the images of, you know, work um, that we did around the, the uh, Bantu Authorities Act when it was finally fully repealed and, um, you know, taking this opportunity to educate the parliamentarians specifically in the um, uh, committee that that focuses on 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 land reform um that you know these are the issues that communities um uh, and this is sis corny from from the northwest and she now leads the alliance for rural democracy but these are the issues that are you know people in the eastern cape as these colleagues representing uh these colleagues from limpopo province um you know these colleagues from um, Eastern Cape as well, you know, speaking to parliamentarians and really telling the stories. And so, you know, Mum Sezani was really faithful to that task of having to carry people's narratives from the grassroots deep in the community right up to, um, you know, Cape Town, where the parliamentarians needed to hear directly from people. And then her work would go global. I remember the last time I saw her was, was um, in New York in um, 2017, when we both attended this uh, session on gender, land and extractive investments. And um, she and I were the two South African representatives at this meeting. And I just remember being so blown away because remember, right, like I had seen her down in the the, the very grassroots in deep rural Guazulu uh, uh, Natal doing her thing and just being amazing and hitting it out of the ballpark. And then right through to parliament and then right up to this international stage where, you know, you're gathered with like members of the World Bank and representatives of, you know, the Ford Foundation and what have you, and um, these great inter in, in, international institutions. And Mom says, I need just like, you know, just stood her ground and spoke so clearly and was just such a strong voice and representative, um, but always so gracious in everything that she did and, and just so, so, um, uh, she drew you in, in her manner. And um, I just was blown away. And, and to be honest, like, you know, that impression of, of her um, has stayed with me. And, and I think of her as one of my role models. Um, and, you know, the work that she did was so important because essentially she, she fought for the, 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 the taking of human rights um, and, and the rights in the constitution from being just paper rights to being rights that are actually realized for people in real life. And, and so I want to end by saying that the work continues as, you know, she and I worked together and, and this is the book that I wrote on, you know, access to justice and human security in rural South Africa, which we tried to present to the legislature um, and they weren't uh, particularly receptive to what we had to say. Um, 
but the thing is that the work continues. And I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, the work that Mam Sezani tried to do and that we all need to continue to do is to present these alternatives, right? To 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 present these alternatives to the narratives that prevail in um, spaces of power and in spaces of legislative and policymaking dominance. Um, and I love this quote that there's no global social justice without cognitive justice, global cognitive justice. And I think that that's something that Mam Sezani definitely represented. And so um, I think one of the things that is important for us to do in carrying the work uh, of Mam Sezani forward is to resolve this, um, you know, South Africa's fundamental paradox where the country with the most progressive constitution in the world remains the most unequal country in the world. Um, and, and, and ask the question, what if solutions are located furthest from the center, which is where rural women reside. And I love that that's what Mam Sezani represented and brought to the fore as a question in every single space that she um, went. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandiso, and, and thank you so much for the photographs. Um, it, it just feels like Mam Sezani is present with us. So thank you. Nambonisa? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can stop the sharing of the screen. Who, me? I don't no, know. No. Just... Oh. no, no, I'm asking the technical people. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, and thank you very much for this opportunity to, to remember uh, Umam Suzanne and to honor her. <coughs> especially during Women's Month. Thinking about what this month means and thinking about the importance of us looking at the history of the women's struggles and the intellectual contributions of women like Suzanne, um, going beyond this tendency of looking at history through the names of big women and big men of history, but they actually look at um, the people who made revolutions happen. I, I can't think of a better example today than Suzanne Nguban for a number of reasons, and I'll touch on these. Firstly, when I met, first met Mam Suzanne was in the 90s. She was working for the ASO for Afra. And I was trying to figure out what we had to look at in the ANC, because I was in the ANC Commission for the Emancipation of Women. We had to look um, at and how we had to look at bringing the issues that affect rural women um, into, into the conversation. When I met Mam Susani, I was incredibly grateful for the way in which she was, like so many other people I was encountering, but her being based in KZN, the way in which she was applying her thought processes to land and to traditional leaders, that was in the 90s already. I would meet her later in the, in the, in the struggles and campaigns and public hearings on the traditional courts bill. Thinking about this, I have looked back at what Adrian Rich wrote about the way in which women's struggles and the way in which the feminist um, struggles of different centuries have been read and presented as if they came from nowhere, each generation coming and not looking at what has gone beyond, I mean, before them. And just as the entire history of women's struggle for self-determination has been muffled in silence over and over. One serious cultural obstacle encountered by any feminist writer is that each feminist work has tended to be received as if it emerged from nowhere, as if, it, as if each of us had lived, thought, and worked without any historical past or contextual present." And good. I think in month, like this, in times like this month, 
Women's Month, I think it's important that we look at the history of women's struggles in this country and this particular match that we so celebrate, that we look at it as part of an ongoing journey of women of this country. The first protest by women against any forms of restrictions of movement going back to mid 19th century. That is when the first attempts were made for people, um, for women's movement or black women's movement to be curtailed. It didn't succeed then. I think it's also important to look at the kinds of different roles that the institution of traditional leadership and traditional leaders themselves has have played in the struggle. We look at, for example, the kind of alliances that um, women in Northwest and um, Chief Mugwa had in responding and refusing um, the instructions by, um, by Fervut uh, when he asked chiefs to tell their wives to carry the passes in the 1950s. I think it's important that we look at Sizani not only from the perspective of the recent struggles that she was part of, but also look at how her entire life, she was part of anti-apartheid struggles in this country, how she, she moved from the struggles in that era and came to the kind of positions that she had um, in, in, you know, in, 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 the, in the late 90s and today. I'm grateful for us for this opportunity to look back at Cezanne because it, it encourages us to look at the kind of society that created her, the kind of society that made it necessary for an activist like Cezanne to emerge. We know that from her own early life, she was deeply affected by the way in which patriarchal institutions and understand cultural patriarchal institutions actually um, robbed her and her mother um, of their rights to land. <clears throat> and this is the thing that has always fascinated me about Sizani, that she lived the feminist slogan, the personal is political. So she wasn't just a woman who had come to embrace feminism, had come to embrace gender justice, had come to embrace the importance of land only out of cerebral understanding, that she took her own life in her family and used that to inform the kind of activist she would be and fight for the kind of change that she was fighting for. Susanne died in her 70s. It, it, it always struck me as incredibly powerful that a woman of her age could talk so freely about the kind of domestic violence her mother experienced at the hands of her husband, that is Susan's father. That at all times she was always weaving these lived experiences with the kind of ideals that she embraced. I think this is important because often today, when young feminists especially speak um, and talk about intersectionality, we often forget that we have inherited movements that were intersectional before, even before we used the concept intersectional. Sizani was part of the movement against apartheid that believed in the emancipation of women in gender equality, but also saw that as linked to other forms of exclusions, forms of oppression um, and inequality. Women being oppressed in terms of gender, black women being oppressed in terms of race, and working women being in, in, uh, um, oppressed in terms of class. What we called then uh, triple oppression, which really is about understanding how one form of oppression intersects with another. Her own life example is in fact a journey in perpetual search 
for the ways in which this, these interconnected forms of oppression can also result in interconnected forms of liberation. She worked in women's organizations. She works in rural um, organizations focused at advancement of rural people. She also worked as a trade unionist. So that in itself brings all these different experiences that she had in the post apartheid in the apartheid era and then carried it in the post apartheid um, period. So Susan's work with the rural women's movement did not come out of nowhere. As Adrian Rich says, that the women who have come before us often pave the way, and sometimes the risk of that, I would add, is that those who came before us are forgotten. Think, for example, today, how we look at the 1956 March. I bet many people don't even know the woman who, whom Sophie de Brain replaced in that match, but we know Sophie de Brain. We don't know that when somebody else did not come, uh, could not make it, that um, then Sophie uh, represented her. Many of us don't even know that before 1956 March, there were other smaller matches um, against uh, passes in the transfer. Many of us don't even know that the march itself, the 1956 march, was in fact a huge conundrum for the liberation movement, for the ANC. That the ANC was not in favor of the 1956 march. They came very late to the party. That um, they were not in favor, they were anxious and nervous about the, 19, uh, the, the, the Federation of South African Women, which was formed um, in 1954. That the, the charter that, uh, the first charter that we had, the 1954 uh, charter, which was launched by the Federation of Women, looked at so many other things, including what they referred to as the customs and the laws and belief systems. So today, when we look at these issues, it's as if we, our generation, are only now discovering how um, customary practices and, and, and traditions sometimes hold women back. I think it's important that in honoring Susan that we go back and look at some of these pre-1956 um, processes um, that we, we, we familiarize ourselves with women beyond the four who landed up on the, on the steps of, of, of the capital. That we look at the kind of women who, who went door to door under the guise of raising funds for stockings for, for the march, for women to wear the, the uniform and wear black stockings. But really that going that door to door, raising funds for those stockings was the way, one of the most effective ways in which women talked about the 1956 march. Then we look at the fact that Mandela himself, when he talks about how they prepared for the defiance movement in the 1950s that he credits, and correctly so, I'm, I'm quick to add, he credits the, the Satyagraha movement, um, which was led by Gandhi, for having helped them to overcome their fear and um, of prison and the stigma that is attached to prison. But in 1913, when the Satyagraha movement um, marched in Bloemfontein. There was another march in Bloemfontein. There was a march of women, black women, um, because Bloemfontein had become a capital, a commercial capital at that time of, of, of that region. And women were coming from all over South Africa and looking for work and, and new opportunities in these emerging towns. That in 1913, against the extension of yet another permit that they had to pay in order to use the public bathrooms, which they needed for laundry. Um, these women actually took up this battle on their own without any man providing them any guidance. Uh, Sol Plaki writes uh, uh, eloquently about his visits um, to these women who were in prison, about how he found them with no shoes and no boots and no coats, and Bloemfontein was cold at that time. That this concentration 
in the big moments of history and the big men and to some extent the big women of history robs us the knowledge of what women like Sizani have actually done. When I met Mam Sizani again, um, I think it was in 2008, I, I, I remember this kind of energy that she had, this quiet but intense energy that she had, like a smoldering fire, as she was explaining the conditions of women in rural KwaZulu-Natal. Susani was rooted in her African identity. She lived, she lived an incredibly simple life uh, with, with no adornment and no unnecessary fluff. In a country today where the first thing that people do when they get to office is to loot and take from the poor, we need to celebrate the kinds of people like Suzanne who give without expecting anything. The kinds of leaders in our communities who do not feel that the, the kind of material, the rush for the kind of material fluff is what confirms leadership for them. So we learn from Sizani in the true sense of the feminist tradition, not only her politics, not only the work she did, but how she lived. I remember today a woman who was very quietly spoken, who listened to young people who listened when you spoke and engaged when you spoke. No matter how tired Mam Susanne was, and those meetings often can go on and on in the night, she would never leave to go to sleep until she made sure that everybody, especially the rural women um, with whom she would have traveled to Cape Town, that everybody was comfortable and everybody was sorted out. Often, Men assumed that because she was a Zulu woman, that um, she, they could bully her. Mam Sizani was short, unassuming, very simple, but you made a mistake of your life if you thought that she was a pushover. There were incidents where Umam Sizani got really angry. And those incidents, most of them concerned the mistreatment of another person. It was never about herself. I remember once a, um, she was speaking in parliament in a public hearing and this traditional leader said, oh, shame, mom. This poor mother the white people have told her what to do and she has to fulfill her job. She just looked at him, she didn't respond to them. But when another man interrupted and tried to bully um, Aninka Klassens during a hearing in parliament, Mam Susani was so angry, she, she wanted the meeting to come to an end. Once we were sitting in um, a, a small uh, meeting that was hoping to panel beat the traditional courts bill into the kind of bill that respected the constitutional principles. And this man, you know, when Constance was now the convener of the Alliance for Royal Democracy, when Constance was speaking, this man from um, Northwest used the fact that they were from the same province and said really just nasty things to Constance and just undermined her. So we were in, uh, in Pretoria in a, in a boardroom in the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Development. Umam Sizani was so angry. She, in fact, got up told Deputy Minister um, John, John Jeffries and said, this meeting is over. There, there was Connie, this young woman that Mamsuzani felt that was treated unfairly. For me, 
these are many flashes that show the depth of Sizani's commitment to equality. That the young people who would be in the meetings would naturally gravitate towards her or she would go to them. And she would sit and she would listen and she would listen and she never imposed her ideas and her views. In most meetings that she was part of, her instinct was always, as you saw with the flip charts, her instinct was always to translate, to make sure that the, the flip charts uh, captured what was being said and captured it in Isuzu. I would meet Sizani in 2016 in the West, in the Eastern Cape. And she was at, at home in the Eastern Cape as she would have been when we visited her in KZN. And it was this transcendence of the limiting ethnic identities and a commitment to a larger sense of South Africanness that I celebrate the most. Finally, we all know how Suzanne died and the incredibly painful and dehumanizing way in which she was left to die. I have thought about Mam Suzanne's lessons when she was alive, and I have thought about lessons that she gives us even in death. But when we look at her and the way she died, we are forced to think of those many South Africans who have been left to die in that way. Those many South Africans who have been disappointed, who have been let down by the health department, by the police. And we have to ask even now in this time of a pandemic, is this the way people should be living? Is this the way people should be dying? At the moment, of her death shortly before that, I spoke to her. She, she sent me a message saying, Danami, my child. And then I responded. We talked. She had incredible anxiety about the case they had launched against Ingonyama Trust, the case against um, the leases that people were forced to pay. I think those moments were lonely for Susanne because she didn't have the natural support that she would have had if people were able to move around the country. That in those moments of doubt of whether that court case would empower the people who had taken it in terms of the kind of ruling that would come, or whether it would affirm the abuse that they were experiencing at the hands of Ingonyama Trust if they lost the case. I think she would have wanted to have more of her sisters around her. But in the pandemic, this was not possible. And I think for this, I want to remember her. When Ingo Onyama Trust judgment came, I was very sad that it came when Susanne was no longer alive. But as she would have wanted, somehow we have to carry on. And I think part of this is a commitment on knowing the women who have made these freedoms possible and honoring them always. Thank you. Thank you, Nambonisa, for that moving tribute uh, in, in Women's Month, especially in a month that we do not have a lot to celebrate. It was very moving. Thank you. Shireen? Sure. Can I, may I carry on? Yes, please. Okay. Good afternoon, colleagues, and um, thank you very much to both our presenters before who've set the tone and um, the context within which uh, Mam Suzani's work has, has been rooted. So mine's is a slightly different um, story. But it is linked to, so the first time, so I'm, I'm part of uh, AFRA, Association for, um, 
I'm on the board of AFRA, Associate for Rural Advancement, which has been an organization for over 40 years and has been part of the struggle for land rights um, for, for South Africans for, for the last 40 plus years. And um, when AFRA started um, in the very first um, few years, Mam Suzani was one of the, the the key staff members as a field worker, and she then developed and became part of the program staff, etc., and led a lot of the work. and And we know that um, in those days, the land rights struggles were about evictions, were about displacement, about the lack of respect for households who had buried ancestors on land, um, and those are the struggles that she was part of. and had to had to deal with, and that's where my contact with her uh, came. And I and I think that throughout her life, both during 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 the time with Afra, but also subsequently with Afra, um, subsequent to leaving Afra, um, her work has symbolised a concern and a care, um, and a, a, a deep commitment to addressing equity um, for women particularly and rural women particularly and then i think what my presentation is going to do is talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've done um, inspired by the work of people like mom Cezani, around what is it that we know about land reform and women within that context of land reform and displacement um, and what we know about that historically as well as what what does it mean for us today because we see the same issues today so I'm just going to share my presentation and um, I, I won't go through every single slide, but I will uh, highlight some key points and maybe if there's some questions, um, we can take those. So not sure if you can see my presentation. Are you able to see it? Uh, no. Oh, yes. No. 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 You can see. No. Screen. Yes. OK, I'm going to put that on slideshow. OK, um, so this is work. Um, so the title uh, actually was Trapped in Poverty, and it's about women, land distribution, state funded agricultural development support. And is it a pathway out of poverty? It's work. Um, so the background to this paper, I will just briefly talk to these these uh, these issues in the, in the, in the presentation. They just give the background, the policy context, a contextual snapshot, all of which you will see resonates with work that Mam Cezani was doing. Um, the framework that we've used for analyzing livelihoods, particularly from a gender framework. And then I'm going to share with you some results and some conclusions. So this was work that was done by HSRC going right back to 2013-14, uh, of which I was part of the team led by Professor J Peter Jacobs, who has extensively worked on food security issues. Um, and this was funded by the then Department of Rural Development. And the purpose was to understand the relationship between agrarian reform programs that government had launched and rural development and to specifically look at what the lessons were. So it didn't have a gender focus per se. I, because of my role in the project, I, it was, I deemed it necessary that we did bring the gender focus in. And this paper, um, I, tr I tried to address that. So what is the policy environment that we were dealing with? So we have a whole lot of, doc a whole lot of policies, legislation, et cetera, all of which commit to gender equality in legislation and policy and programming. So there were huge expectations that that land and agrarian reform would change the rural economy substantially. And we know that the rural economy, um, women are such a key, well, women are key role players in both the urban and rural, but but much more in the rural economy. Um, and, and, and many of the government policy documents, the NDP, they, all of them have press, professed to a vision of vibrant, equitable, sustainable rural communities, food security for all. And gender has been at the at underpinning all of this. Gender equity, overarching theme across all of those. Now let's talk about the policy environment. And I'm using the words very, very deliberately about being broken promises, because at the heart of that vision was a was a vision of five outcomes. Farmland, sustainable farmland redistribution, access to an affordable food, and diverse foods, sustaining and enhancing rural services and livelihoods, promoting rural job creation, and facilitating 
inclusive and sustainable growth. Um, and I think so a lot, a lot of commitment on paper, in policies, etc. And across all of them, gender, gender equity was an overarching theme. So the study was trying to look at, so what does this mean when we look at women within all of those programs? And I, and I think that's where we talk about the, the broken promises and um, what the act um, was expected to do um, to repeal what happened in, in 1913 and what the act achieved. So the snapshot of that was that um, a, a lot of the studies that have been done from from way back um, up to now, both in the HSRC, the um, PLAS, a number of other stakeholders have done that overwhelmingly the consensus of a failed land reform, land and grain reform program, both in its pace and outcomes, the underperformance of the land reform departments against their own goals, um, the declining share of agriculture to the economy, and then in relation to that to rural livelihoods. So um, the push push factor for rural communities to have to come to urban urban um, context and urban sites. Um, and that in all of that, we found that women disproportionately share in the burden of poverty and inequality and rural women specifically. What we found also was that there was very limited linkages between the programs that were put in place around land reform and their contributions to poverty eradication and food security. And I think the recent um, unrest in um, or insurrection, as our president would like to call it, is a is a absolutely vivid example of those failures in our system, um, and those failures were for urban and rural communities. Um, there was and, and another problem is that the policy um, and the data that's used to inform policy or programming has been largely gender neutral, which is again a huge problem because how do you design programs and policies if you don't know who your target is. What is, you know, gender is not a, just a homogenous team. It's, it's got um, all kinds of um, um, diversity and differentiation that we need to take account, etc. cetera. Um, so the broad question that we were looking at was, uh, can the, could the land and the grain reform produce an altered livelihood dynam a dynamic, a dynamic that addressed the principles in our constitution, the, the Bill of Rights in that constitution. And the questions we were asking were, under what conditions could and does land reform distribution, coupled with state-funded agriculture support, contribute towards reducing food and hunger security? But also, in what way do men and women benefit in the same way? And if not, what are the design features that enhance the gender outcomes? So the framework that we've used was a sustainable livelihoods framework. It is a different framework. It's been used, and there are debates about the framework, but broadly it talks about the fact that there are, that uh, people live in particular vulnerable contexts, which is the this first block, that you have a set of assets, human assets, natural capital, um, financial capital, etc. So you have the social capital, all of these different capital, um, physical capital that enables you to participate in government programs. However, there is still requires that government set in place the policies, processes and laws and a culture, but also then it's puts in place the structures and the stakeholders who will res respond. And if all of those work together, those should contribute towards livelihood strategies being implemented and those should then lead to livelihood. Um, so what is the context that we're dealing with here? Um, there, there is a wealth of research that speaks to the fact that land reform uh, can contribute significantly to poverty reduction, food security and enhanced livelihoods. Um, the options open to individuals and households are determined in large days, large days by their asset status. And in rural contexts, natural capital, access to land is a critical determinant of that. Um, but together with coupled with that would be the access to financial capital. If I have the land and no financial capital to till that land and to grow um, crops or, or, or to have livestock, I have no ability, in fact. Um, so, and 
the final point here in the context is that control over the assets. So when that control is given to the male members of the household or to the Nkosi or the Isindunas, etc., um, so your PTO, the permission to occupy, came from them, that, that created the vulnerability. So broadly, I'm not going to go to details in the in the methodology, but essentially this was a mixed method study. We focused on three provinces, a Northwest, KwaZulu-Natal and Western Cape, largely because of the variations in agricultural production in these provinces, and also because of the fact that there was quite a strong predominance of land, um, agriculture, land, agriculture development support implemented those, in those provinces for which we could get data. In some of the other provinces, there was literally those government departments were not even able to provide any any valuable data that you could um, you could use or that you wouldn't challenge uh, for for the weaknesses in the data. Um, I'm not going to speak to the flower sampling framework. Essentially to say to you that um, we we were targeting between 450 and um, 600 land reform beneficiaries. Um, we managed to get 286 and I'll explain a little bit more about that if you want to. And of those um, 119 um, received agricultural development support. So look at that, 119 of 200. So you give people land, but you do not give all of those people access to, to support to, 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 to develop that land. Um, and that, yeah, so that, that's the background. So what did we find? We found that of the households that we, on our sample, and we believe our sample is reasonably representative of the provinces. We looked at it against that's SA data. And what we found was that on average, the households were double the national average in stats SA. So we talk about large households, um, KZN specifically 7.5. Now, why I'm stressing this is because government has these formulas that decide that average households are this, and therefore the average amount of money will be that. But that does not, does not relate to the reality of what a household of three would need as opposed to what a household of seven or eight. And in fact, in our in, in some of the outliers were households as large as 12 um, and even 20. Um, so very large households in, in some of these provinces, particularly the KZN, but the average is here. Um, gendered, women, gender households tended to be women house led households were larger and had more children. So what we're we talking about here, greater number of dependencies in women headed households. Um, okay, the average age of the household head was 54 years old. We know that this is a reality for agricultural work and for rural communities in general. We found that there was generally low levels of education, but it was even lower for women, uh, for female-headed households, and, even, and equally so in terms of the fact that um, quite a substantial proportion of the women had only primary, primary education or, or no schooling compared to their male counterparts. So only 54% of them, not only, just over half of them had primary education and no schooling compared to a large number of men. Um, and human capital, which is the skills, education training, again, we know is critical to, um, is part of the livelihoods Pentagon. Employment status, again, showed that majority of the household heads were pensioners. So the reliance on the pension as, as a critical um, social protection uh, wage, a social protection floor, um, and the reliance on pensioners to support entire families again. So this, this story and these colors might be difficult to understand, but if you just look at the first colors right at the bottom here, the light gray is, uh, and this is the, you know, these, this is female headed households who got the land, but no support. And 24% of them were unemployed compared to only 4% of those. So if you gave them agricultural support, they were more likely to find employment or to find income security. But look at the comparison. Compared to men, more women, more 50% more women did not get agriculture. So men were favored. And look at the number of men who, so you found more men with agriculture support still being unemployed. Okay, so this speaks to the fact that men were not using their productive capital in a way because they were still not producing and not. Okay, so that that's a, an important story about the fact of who you give resources to and what happens. Now we know that in the social protection field, giving women money will in, enable household security. Giving men money doesn't do that. So apologies, I needed to put that off. So 
What did we find about the gendered patterns of labor, of land ownership? Um, there's evidence of beneficial impacts of land ownership in general. They, some women did improve their ac access to credit facilities, and that was, in a sense, in incentivizing long-term investments for them in farming, etc. For women, that was important because it also enhances their economic autonomy and their household well-being, access to financial resources. Oh, 54% of land reform beneficiaries were men, right? Only 29% were joint ownership, and we know that joint ownership often le leads to women not being uh, granted sufficient ownership. And only 15, 17% of land reform beneficiaries were, were women. And so this questions the extent to which government programs, commitment, government programming commitment to gender, um, how, how real is that? And, and these rates are much lower compared to what we're seeing in sub-Saharan Africa, which in some instances, those countries, many of the countries, they have a lower GDP than we have, but yet more women benefit, 24% average in sub-Saharan countries compared of ownership compared to women. And that was from a review of 16 studies. So a huge problem again of how we compare with other countries, even with the GDP that we have of higher. Access to agriculture development support. So South Africa has had two programs um, that have helped people to get um, uh, agricultural development support. One of them led through the Department of Agriculture and the ACAS, and, um, and the other one through the previously land reform department. And what we found was men with male landowners were the largest recipients, again, as I said to you, of state funded agricultural support. Um, so. So this is the actual funding of it. But what we also found was that in terms of um, um, training support, so you have your agricultural extension offices, they're predominantly male, and predominantly men seem to be getting more of that support than women. So again, skewed access for women. Um, the, the very interesting finding was that um, on average, the land actually transferred was seven, 784 hectares. But they, but the households that did not access agricultural support, they got more land. They had slightly more land, right? But the land utilization across all households was very low. So we're throwing vast amounts of land to people, but because we haven't given everybody the capabilities or we haven't assessed their interest in farming, we realize that there's average only 72 hectares, which is often sustainable. Sus uh, was household, household subsistence farming or perhaps very minimal, um, you know, um, outgrower schemes, etc. But not not substantial at all. Um, female headed households were who were getting agriculture support were were clearly seen to be extending the use. So more women who had agricultural support were using more land. So again, a very positive. If you give women support, they're likely to do even better with the land than they than their male counterparts. OK, so that this just gives you details of the land size. I'm not going to go into detail about it, except that you can see the land sizes in certain provinces um, were considerably lower. So there was there was a bigger land size in KZN than in other provinces. But what were the outcomes that we were looking at uh, in terms of asset accumulation? Um, so the, the dark blue, the dark turquoise is that before the asset, before their situation and at the time of the survey. So almost all the households, right, increased their asset base. And I talk about asset base, meaning farming equipment or maybe a truck or whatever. But look at, look at how interesting this is. Women who had agricultural support were able to accrue more assets into the house. And we looked at seven common assets uh, that are typical to farming. So it could be um, the, a water well, it could be whatever. But women were more productive in, in, in upskilling or in, up, um, in increasing the amount of assets that they had. Um, so this idea that on the one hand, you've got women with very low levels of education, but who may have historically in other ways learned but who are able to master and, and actually uh, secure assets, et cetera. So this is, this is a very positive story, which again talks about the, 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 the skills that women bring into, into these programs. We asked Sorry, a question Shadi, about um, what was the... Uh, sure. Uh, about another two Do minutes? Do I need to complete? Yes. 
Okay, I'm gonna gonna end with this one, except basically, I just want to show you what we found. Women who had land, but without agricultural support, right? This was their prevalence, depth, and severity of poverty. Look at that. Compared to women who didn't have the poorest in this group were those women with farmland, but with no support. So this is just a very telling that female headed households were the poorest and uh, with and the, the those who this is the level of poverty and depth, etc. Um, I'm going to conclude then is to say broadly. So the broader summary is that um, land reform without um, and cultural support is, will not generate livelihood outcomes in the way that women's households would be. And there's a compelling story for both female headed households as well as those uh, with agricultural support and without support that they are trapped in poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen, and sorry for rushing you. Um, I, no, I think the, I the importance here is the sketching the context in which Mam Zazani worked and the importance of, of land reform and agrarian reform. Um, but, you know, without the gender lens on that, I think we, we're going to co continue to see this very serious inequality, um, especially for women uh, living in, in the rural areas. So I'm now going to there's a, a short video, but before we uh, before we go to the video, I'm just going to ask um, Langaleswe Ngubani to say a few words um, uh, on behalf of the Rural Women's Movement, but also as, as the grandson of Mam Zazani. Oh, yes, yes, with pleasure, with pleasure. Uh, I would like to greet you all first again and kind of send a thank you for, for the invitation. You know, it means a lot to be given an opportunity to speak with such strong and powerful women. Having them give you an opportunity to actually share for the team. I, I thank you a lot for that. Uh, firstly, I, I'll introduce to most people because I'm sure most people are not aware where my, I am Langalezo Kubane, uh, the grandson of the late Cezanne Kubane. And I am a second year student at Sidara College of Agriculture. And yes, we, we sent through firstly, like the, the support we've been getting from every wing, six sister organizations, everyone who's been involved with the Kuoko. Like the, 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 the support we've been getting just out of this world. Ever since the other day, we sent out word, Kuoko is no more, you know, till today, and we still have it. Like beautiful messages pouring in, even people stretching out Jay, to assist in Jay, even with finances. You know, some people are, you know, going out of their ways to actually, you know, give out a helping hand. And it shows we see who walk was working hand in hand with people who are, you know, solid people, extremely solid and cared about, you know, the well being. It's not something that was just Jay, a face out, you know. And I'd like to send through like a uh, I'd like to excuse some of the RWM members. Uh, some have uh, made few commitments, and by the time I sent through the invitation to them, they already made the commitments, and they, they are here in spirit, though, and they have sent me to be their spokesperson, but if I should say, you know. And I would like to share you a few words, Jay, of, of the person who Coco was to me, personally, you know, because I know she was a great, uh, great human being to, you know, people around across the world and most definitely people of the rural areas, you know, she has made that mark. But to me, I, I feel it's more than, it's more than that. We all lost like a hero. But to me, she, I didn't even list her as a girl, you know, she was, she was a man. Me and Usana, my older sister, we grew up knowing her as our mother. I'll be upfront and honest with you. You know, having a mother who is, you know, in the forefront of of, of majority of, uh, you know, human rights uh, duties. You know, you 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 tend to be, you you don't have that much time with them at all. And we we felt that we felt that Uzi, she went out and she spends like her days assisting people and. To us, it was always that thing, 
like do people actually appreciate you know what she's doing because she spent most of her years i could remember when she was still at afra you know it was it was her being dedicated to dedicated and to giving her all and to ensuring we see everyone she made sure that us two were taken care of but she also made sure with everyone outside there was also taken care of i heard this is so silly so saying Uti, you know she didn't feel like she was going to meet a woman when she spoke about it i can clarify and say Uti, Ukoko had this strong sense in jay she wasn't just a regular woman she had the you know <laughs> she 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 had the 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 ability to stand in a room she being the shortest my you but she had this ability of standing in the room and just capturing everyone the attention capture the respect and just capture it. you would have people coming to her like you see <laughs> even with with celebrities you know she'd speak <laughs> and then you begin seeing people coming towards her just to get a few words from her like we noticed that too and there's a lot we learned yeah from her you know from her being a mother you know to her being the leader and our mentor at home you know we 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 like there's a lot that we picked up the lot that we learned and i am glad uti in as much as yeah, she didn't get to witness like the victory but i know for a fact uti she knows Uti, like the case went for us you know with the Konyama trust and i know i can already picture her, her, her you know her reaction after finding out those news it must you know definitely sure it could have been about but 10 times more than it was when it was passed in there by a traditional court bill and you know it was kind of a celebration at home when that happened and i know we would have had something similar to that if it was she was still around but gay yeah, i know for a fact we could see even us being gathered today in jail like this she's she's with us and i don't have much to like to say instead you know it, it's a privilege to be amongst all of you in the house like it's it's more than a privilege and one thing i want to point out would see rwm is still yeah because we have our board members who, who are still very much active and they have the same drive as Ukoko. Well. they may not be may, like you know they may not be Susan Uban and I do not think we could ever have another Susan Uban who cross nights on a daily basis ensuring that the work is done she'd only close her eyes to get some rest when she's at least 70 or 80 percent done she she won't leave the the job the job Jay, out and hold there without without being certain of it's okay we almost done now i can get a rest yeah. but i do know of people who have the same tribe who are made of the same way and who will ensure we we'll see how wm stays afloat and it just doesn't you know fizzle out in the air but thank you very much very much like I, i'm sure of words but yeah we are here today and we are here to celebrate the life of Ukoko and she was an amazing human being she was an amazing human being you know i feel i felt like we lost a protector at home when we lost her we lost like more than a protector it it breaks my soul that uh, just a few days before she went silent you know i was with her and i i will live with this thing at the back of my head saying that when she came to visit me at school i should have that should have gone back home you know, like that will live with me forever see i should have gone back home again things tend to happen the way they happen we have very little control of what we do but get i feel we have more than enough control to you know make sure we see what happened to gogo comes as a lesson to most of us we see we should ensure we see we have you know we give out the same the same energy that is you know we we getting like we go in short we see most of us i'm speaking of the family we would see we are all taken care of but it was very little people who gave back that energy when she needed it the most and i personally will, will like as i say i will hold it to me there for the rest of my life as i should have literally should have went back home but yeah, there's no excuse for any, you know, anything that happened after that. 
but yeah, she was an amazing human being and showing by the likes of people who are in house now, like we can tell Uguti, she had a lot of people where she touched and through her work, she was, you know, she was solid too. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Langaleswe, and and I'm sure she is with us, and she touched so many lives. So thank you for that tribute. Um, I'm now going to ask Nongkutula uh, Mitimonye just to say a few words about the video that we uh, <clears throat> that we're going to end with. Um, hello, Nongkutula. Um, hello everyone, um, thank you. Um, it is indeed an honor to be here with all of you. I'm actually choking um, from what has been shared. Um, I was asked just to introduce the short video that we'll um, be screening shortly. Um, so Afra is currently supporting farm dweller women through um, um, a group of women living on farms in Umkungunlovu um, district. Um, so we are assisting them to self-organize, um, placing their lived experiences um, directly into current uh, public discourse um, and land matters. Um, so the film that we are about to watch um, is called Kinam Bogoto, Be Strong Like a Rock. It gives a voice to the largely uh, voiceless um, women farm dwellers um, who explain how gendered super exploitation is explored and maintained on farms. Um, the film highlights a few things. Um, it highlights how women farm dwellers are kept compliant and submissive as workers, wives and citizens, how they are forced to accept long hours involved in seasonal work um, and paid below minimum wage. Um, it also highlights how um, they are forced to live in unsafe serviced rundown um, houses that increase their labor hours and put their health and the health um, of their children and families um, at risk. Um, so today, I think as we are remembering Umam Sizan, I think we, we find comfort and in these women, the stories that women are that, that, that these women are um, are telling, um, and um, that they are they've continued um, to lead the work that Umam um has been doing in in um, uh, you know leading numerous um, campaigns um, and advocacy lobbying um, for the equal rights of all rural women um, um, in in this country. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the video. Thank you. Thank you, Nongkutula. I'm going to thank everyone who has, has uh, been speakers today and who have participated for your moving tributes to Mam Sazani, and I hope that we will all cherish her beautiful memories. So we're now going to watch um, the, the video. Um, we will go over time, so you're welcome to stay. Um, and, and if you have to leave, then we, we understand. So, but thank you very much for, for all your beautiful tributes. Marita, you can show the video.
ngihluphekile ngidinga umsebenzi ngiwuthola sengihlukunyeziwe ngoko cansi angikwazi ngisho nokuzithathela izinqumo angiziqhenyi ngomsebenzi wami zinyembezi zehla mihla namalanga ngihlala ngidliwa ngumzwangedwa imicabango yam ngomsebenzi wam ibuhlungu eyami lempilo ngingumuntu wesifazane sengikhulile ngingumfelokazi izwi lami lishaywa indiva ngisho nabanye besifazane angisakwazi ngisho nokuzithathela izinqumo impilo yami inzima manje eyami lempilo sithi phansi ngokuhlukunyezwa ngokuhlukunyezwa kwezingane nabantu besifazane ngokuhlukunyezwa kwamalungelo omhlaba phansi ngokubukelwa phansi kwesithunzi somuntu wesifazane phambili qina mbokodo phambili qina qina mbokodo qina organization e uqina mbokodo e uqina mbokodo sawa kha noma sawenza ngesimo sokuthi masihlangana kuma organization njengako siyanqoba usiyanqoba uyini uy organization esuke ikhethwe emphakathini abantu abasuke bekhethwe emphakathini abayomela umphakathi wabo so koma sibala ngokwahlukahlukana kwabo ngokukhetha ke kulawo siyanqoba kubukeka abantu besilisa bebabaningi ngaphezu kwabantu besifazane e sase sifuna ukuthola ukuthi kungani labantu besilisa abantu besifazane bengawa ngameli i ama meeting noma imhlangano uzokwazi ukuthamelela aba imphakathi yangakubo kodwa sase sibona ukuthi no izwi labantu besifazane alizwakade ukungazwakali kwalo kuphinde kube nezinto am um, iculture esikhulele ngaphansi kwayo iyasinikeza ukuthi uma umuntu wesifazane efana umthobelo wesilisa loko okuzenza ukuthi thina abantu besifazane sizenyeze futhi singaze thembi entweni esizenzayo noma athi wase sihlangene lapho kusiyanqoba mase kufanele sikhulume wena umuntu wesifazane izwi lakho alizwakale kusaka loko ukuthi siyazenyeza Mase se ukhulumileke kodwa mase sithiwa nango ke le voice yakho ubusu ishile noma lo luvolo wakho ubusu likhiphile ake libe ke umuntu wesilisa lisibe selizwakala ke lona ngoba selibe ke umuntu wesilisa ke wena umuntu wesifazane ngoba lishwe wena zizwakala ngoba kuyazi ukuthi umuntu wesilisa ungaphezu ke umuntu wesifazane le nto ke yasibulala kakhulu ke thina abantu besifazane ke ingakho ke sazi sasungula ukuthi sibe noqina mbokodo ozokwazi ukuthi sabantu besifazane sikwazi ukhulisana ngokwembono nangani ngani kwaze kwaze ukuthi noma ngathi wase sihlangene sinabantu besilisa sikwazi ukuthi singazenyezi sikhulume ke sifisa ukukhuluma ngoba ama sinamalungelo kodwa sigcina singakwazi kwasebenzisa ngenxa yezwi lethu oluthala azizwakale uqina mbokodo ke usize kakhulu ngokuthi amalungelo ethu nalawo abambijane besiwazi akhulile sesiyawazi noko futhi nokuzenyeza no asena kumanje ngiyabo Sina mbogoto, sifunu kuchengi isa uguti no mungu esifazane na yunale izwi Uya guazi ugu izu lake kufane luguti tiswagale No manga tiwa ilapla ikulu makona kufane luguti tiswagale izu lake Munga kini uzwagala mazwa bani besi nisa kpela Engi fisa luguti yani ami ibe nefundo eraithi eh khona izokhona uko ukuthi isebenze kahle ingasebenza emaplazini ingagxilazeki isebenze umsebenzi oright
Nama always was seven times. I was a band best person. I lingan and our band best list. I got the Malia corner for Tai Lingan. No one does listen to my Ninga, Kulum, no one does for the Nagota Sevens. I'm our Lingan. No seven puts us seven of Ninga, Kulum, no one does this. Naseka for the solo goods of Fanel Gutta. We are pinned the footy. I pinned the back on him seven. I end I a paralin daughter and the young in the got to be the seven of Babi. Sinenging as a band to best fazan, it much work could you and gain the bas on sevens. Sevens are a plaza in Imyaga, Godwa, Ungatoli. Londo inking at Sinabasab and best fazan. U seven the Imyaga, I Ungatoli is into Elfanning away as Tola is Bonello, Master Tua Uzebenzile, a plaza in Gumnan, the Ungashuako Usa Sevenza. Unga Rabin and King at Sina Savan West Fazan is Nelunga, so good low with the school lady. Ma wants to a Kulelua, so too, look the limit and it leave Yako. I got Kokelik in King Ayet. M Venonga Kokelik way to lap. Sneaking I ogutti one and Kokelikil. Ogus Billy, Gizoham and Yosala Pansy, Ogany Angna, Lulas, Lugutifan and Gegua, Department of Labor, and our Yogan Zales and Defining Gizing was in Goba, I lack of knowledge, my plazing, Yone, Ilangiga Kud. One outside was Ugia, a rogue Department of Labor, Golungis as Uncle Zozindo, is either Wheel, no Mungaya foot is still our cockelig. Ogus Billy, Sexual Saint Hill Pans in Gatheta, Sexfan and William Sebenzin. Aba cash bet a bevy besenza is in desert song. Utu uya m sebenzin, we was your cooler and miakaya cogewa can do your cash waka bush. Inking a sang of his ananas. Utu a figure, Usu signiswa e contract center, lemiaga le oh god to sufu my giona, see pelinda by I, go pin the foot to it all in Sninking a sub and best fazan. And the inking a zetu sininga cool. Usebenze. Ukate, it was seven the kitchen, Ukating, and as Allah Baba Kashi bed, Nai Kuli Bumka, Shiksas, is the party so when Jack Catal and Endoxas, when Osu, is if Usa when we all cut in Jala Pemyango, Usu, nothing, Roma Sim, and the Aranza Belung Banam Shand would go Sam so by in. God having Fisas Aban Besfazan, which is Nasuguma, Siguazo Toluazi, Amalunga, let us was a benzil. Sivesa Sbona, who would see Ukanam Bogoto, Yevok Mele Guven Inception Workshop. Sasha Lagule Inception Workshop, Sija Blidega Kul, who would see Sabes Fazan, a Sikipe, is in Jose to Siguazuna to Pefumula Silla Lane. Sasha Yonkege into Ebis Patagag. As Sivesa Sigbona, Uguti, we are strangers of Lega Kul. Sivesa Sbona would see Kalkunda Zelega, who into Esuganayo, Emma Kaya, Gongaba Gusen, Gonzueni, Las Conza Corner. Even M seven Zini last seven the corner up in the Zelega, who in the corner. Sivas as Pega, who put him clambe, yini in the Esnayens and clambe, Uglum, Sella Lulazi, Esinalo, and Pagatin, who sees the Lego Alfra, Sapumed and Apantle, Sayo, and Pagatin, Sia Kele, a Golo, Clenam Bogoto, Sitlugene, Omas Palaba, who six Saya, the Gomas Palaba, Suga Sugene, Esfigas Actola, Uguti. A best fazane back under the legile, Ngok Fanayo, who's on a zonke, Lezinda was his humble. A Sibesa C. Coca, Guguzica, 
lento le sisuka nayo kungaba sengikonzweni nebhayibheli liyasho ukuthi umuntu esifazane kufanele ahlezi ethobile emakhaya indlela esikhuliswa ngayo abantu besilisa banikezwa lawo mandla lawo bahlezi besicindazeni sibe sesibona ukuthi konje lokho singabe sesenza kanjani noma ke kunezinto esisazama ukuya nazo phambili ukuthi la sizodlula khona kanjani ngithole ukuhlanganyela kwami nokuqina bokodwa ngithole kuyinto enosizo ngoba beqhamuka imbono masehlangene iqhamuka imbono eyahlukahlukene okunye ukuthola ekhona okade ungakwazi ufunde izinto eziningi ngoba ezinye izinto thinade seyabahlali bamaplazi besingazazi kodwa masesehlangene nabahlali nabakaqina bokodwa sathola izinto eningi kade kumele siyifunde athe singazazi ngemithetho yamaplazi kade singayazi thina Embeni kokuba sibumbe isakhiwo esibizwa ngoqina bokodwa sibe sesihamba ke sezivakashela omasipala ngokwehlukana kwabo sabe sesibumbana khona inhlangano ngokomasipala ongqina bokodwa lapho besenzelela khona ukuthi sithole ukuhlukumezeka esibhekana nakho sabantu esifazana emaplazini ukuba sekuvela ke kulabo omasipala ngokuhlukana kwabo kube sekuvela ukuthi ukuhlukumezeka kwethu sabantu esifazane kuncika kakhulu kubantu besilisa ngoba ibona akuyibuka kuyibona abangabahlukumezi kuthina kukho konke ukwenzeka la uthina siya sisithole sehlukumezeka ngokocansi kungani kuyithina abantu abayizisuku ukuhlukumezeka ngokocansi ingoba abantu besilisa banikeziwe amandla ngabanikazi nabaqashi emaplazini ukuthi uma befuna umsebenzi udlula ubona ngoba banikeziwe amalungelo ukuba izinduni umufika ke nduneni uzofuna umsebenzi noma uzocela itorho iya ikuphoqa ukuthi kuze uthole itorho noma umsebenzi kumele ngiqale nidlule enkonzweni yokocansi koyize noma lokho nzibeni kwenza sakuncontsha basebenzisa uthando ukusiyenga ekutheni zivume ukuze nathi sizigcine sondlekile sidlile siziphakele zingane emakhaya kuphlunguke ngoba njalo imicabango yethu ihlale iphlungu kakhulu uma sicabanga ngemsebenzisi nalo yebo sibukeka sisebenza kahle noma sinezikhungu lezithethu zemaplazini kodwa umuntu oqala ulandelela ubheke imumva uthola ukudabuka kokukhulu Eh inkinga esibhekana nayo thina sabantu besifazane siyahlukumezeka ngokuthi masifuna umsebenzi ifuna silale nabantu uthola ukuthi uthe silale nabelungu ukuze uqasheke uthi noma usuthola umsebenzi esiqashile usebenza ngaphakathi ekhishini kelinye ilanga ukungene nje umlungu athi wozoqina ekamerini lakhe kanti akaqokile ebesekutshele ukuthi woza gena qhube kuqine kanti ufuna ukuzolala nawo nomusekhishini avele akuphuthaza uthi ugezizithu seyakuphuthaza umlungu usefuna ukulala nawe ungabuthaza ukuthi umuntu uyayeke emsebenzini uzodlani akutshele futhi ukuthi muhamba uthi yombopha uzophela umsebenzi angeka uzothele lutho futhi ngalokho ungazi ukuthi wenze njani even induna umuntu usebenza ngaphandle futhi ubalekele ukuthi usebenze ekhishini ngoba nomlungu wenza kanje nazi induna zenza kanjalo zabantu abamnyama zikuthisa ngendlela abelungu naba benza ngayo kwenu umuntu esifazane njalo nje mu umuntu esifazane efuna ukholele ekutheni muye emaplazini nje uzodela impilo yakho uzokwenza ekuthiwa kwenze ukuze ukwazi ukondla ingane zakho nomndeni wakini ngoba phela sabantu esifazane sithwele kanzima nje umuntu umu musu uwazi ukuthi umuntu esifazane unengane ubhekana nako konke kufuna ukwenze ulale nanoma ngabe akumnandi kuphlungu vele kodwa uyakwenza lokho uhlonyezwa ngokocansa emaplazini kuyinkinga ngokuthi akukho la sireporta khona kuya kukhulunywe nje enduneni kukhulunywe kugcine kuyindaba ephelele nombani asabukoshwa ukuthi mina masesivela kuzovela ngama
masinduna maje ngiphele lo umsebenzi masi ivelile lento nani ukuthi uathi ngisabela impilo yam niye impilo yangamzami ngizodlana uma ukuthi sengiyavuza egcineni kwaphela okay. ushuthu umsebenzi ngengize ngokuthola indaba kazi ngempela senzeni na sithi sisaba beke balishaya indiva sisaba samani balufaka unyawo kazi ngempela senzeni na asisakwazi nokuzishaya isifuba basidicilele phansi isithundi sethu sisifuna umsebenzi bayasilala kazi ngempela senzeni na senzeni na senzeni na senzeni na